Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming through. Um, so I'm going to get right into it because we've got a lot of slides that we're going to try to burn through, and hopefully we'll get through all of them. Lots of slides, lots of demos. Uh, so I'll be speaking quickly for the most part. Um, so really quick introduction. Um, I'm Harun. This is Marco. We're from a small company called Thinkst. Um, there's not much value in going into too much of detail, except, of course, for the fact that both uh, Marco and I have been doing pen testing and general offensive stuff for a really long time. Um, so most of the stuff that we're looking at today, although uh, it's a defensive talk, is largely, um, to use the stolen phrase, uh, defense strongly guided by offense. Okay, and, and that's kind of what we're going for. Um, really quickly, a plan for what the talk's going to be about or how we're going to do it. We're going to spend a few seconds literally on history because most of you have that bit. We're going to try to talk about why honeypots have failed, like why we're not seeing as many of them as we believe we should. And then we're going to talk about stuff that currently hinders adoption. And at reasonable points along the way, we'll show you technology that we've built, technology that we are putting up for you guys to use, um, so that hopefully you don't have these stumbling blocks. Um, so really quickly, some history. If you're going to do a talk like this, the first thing that comes up is uh, this clearly isn't new. Um, if you hit our conference collector site, you'll see we're tracking around 155 talks that have been given just on honeypots. Um, so, so clearly the stuff isn't new. And if you're talking about deception in warfare, deception in warfare has been around for a really long time. Like it probably goes all the way back to the garden. Um, and um, the military have been using it for long enough. Um, the Joint Chiefs, uh, Joint uh, Chief of Staff, have a document out called JP 313-4, which effectively talks about military deception um, and its uses on the battlefield. Um, it's really interesting. It's really worth uh, reading and going through. But essentially, what they categorize it as is those actions executed to deliberately mislead your opponent giving you a better chance of success with your mission. Um, if you want, uh, a bunch of really smart guys, Tom Cross, Greg Conti, and a whole bunch of them, recently did a talk on deception for the Cyber Defender. Um, it's worth checking out. It was at ShmooCon. I thought it was at DarbyCon. Um, you should check out the slides. They're really worth it. Um, for our intents and purposes, honeypot discussions really went in a certain direction around uh, 1989, 1991, okay? And the two big events that happened at this point, or the two big things, um, were two papers. Uh, well, one was a paper and one was a book. Um, and the first one I'm gonna hor horribly mispronounce was Bull Cheswick's An Evening with Beerford, um, in which a cracker is lured, endured, and studied. Okay, and in it, um, Cheswick, who was working with a whole bunch of smart people, um, Shimomura, Vitsa Venema, um, effectively spoke about tracking down an attacker who had broken into his network. Okay, and at the time it was really simple. He faked system scripts so that he could see what the attacker was trying to do. Um, it was one of the first well-documented cases of using a honeypot to understand your attacker. What's really interesting is that in his conclusion, Cheswick uh, asks, he says, I wondered how much effort this was all worth. It was fun, but what's the point of all of this? Um, and later on actually gets to the point where he says it was educational and stuff, but actually it was too hard to get it right. Okay, and already you start to see a dark future for honeypots that way. Um, the cuckoo's egg, which uh, came up next from Clifford Stoll, um, quick show of hands, how many of you have read the cuckoo's egg? Okay, um, <laughs> we're hitting about 50-50. Um, it's super interesting. It was written way back in 89, but it's actually dated itself really well. Almost as an aside, um, if you go through it, you'll find some really interesting themes. Like it starts off with a disclosure debate. Like if you find a bug, should you tell people about it or should you keep it secret? Um, the next theme that it hit on was uh, questions on the NSA and did they weaken crypto deliberately? Um, one of the other themes that it hit were, and, and this one's useful for us, something that says most attackers don't succeed because of attacker sophistication. They just poke at the obvious places and get there through persistence, not wizardry. Okay, and uh, like I say, it's held up surprisingly well. Um, one of the big themes to come through 
was him complaining when he figured out that actually Robert Morris at the NSA knew about all of the bugs they were being exploited with. And he essentially said, well, hold on. The NSA knows about all these bugs. They're letting us get attacked. How does that work? Okay, and it's a theme that's, uh, that's still pretty prevalent today. Um, but for our interests, the thing that was interesting was actually Clifford Stoll's partner who came up with the idea of using uh, a honeypot. Okay, they had this attacker who occasionally breezed through. She said, let's put out some files. Let's create files that look like valid uh, files that he'd be interested in. And let's see if the attacker actually goes for it. Okay, so it, it kind of gave us the start of, of honeypots as we know it. Um, around uh, 1997, Fred Cohen released the Deception Toolkit. Um, and then in 2000, the HoneyNet project really kicked into gear. Okay, Lance Spitzner did lots of good work, and uh, lots of us who were uh, working in the industry around then kind of got really useful information from the Know Your Enemy series, okay, in which the HoneyNet's stated object uh, objective was learning the black hat community, understanding their tools, tactics, and then sharing all of the lessons learned. Um, now, if we're talking history, there's the bit that says that's distant history and that was uh, all of the honeypot stuff. We want to talk really super quickly about more recent history. Okay, and um, you'll see these on almost all the presentations that you see, so I'll blitz through them. You guys know the numbers. Target were taken. The attackers sat on their network for months before they even knew they were. Um, RSA were attacked, didn't know about it till their crown jewels were gone. Um, the guys over at Belgicom didn't know they were compromised till the reporters showed up to ask them how they felt about being compromised. Okay, and, and that stuff's pretty consistent. If, if you consider even the NSA didn't know about Snowden's breach till Snowden was well away, um, same deal with the OPM, um, it should give us at this point a, hold on, both these things don't make sense. We're saying that there's technology that helped people find out when they were compromised, yet today people are being compromised for months or years and not knowing that it's happening. Um, something's wrong here. And the question that has to come up then is, if honeypots were a reasonable answer, why did they stumble? Why didn't they make a better showing for it? Um, and we say they stumbled. I guess an honest question has to be asked, uh, did they stumble? Um, the quick uh, heuristic we're using there is the honeypot's mailing list. Um, that graph shows activity on the mailing list over time. You'll notice it hit high in 2003. Um, hasn't been doing much since then. Um, but what we want is to look at the reasons um, that honeypots have been faring badly. Okay, so we've got a bunch of them. Um, I'll go through really quickly. Uh, the simple one is it just doesn't demo well. I come to you, I drop down an IDS, I put it on your network, it's gonna show you stuff immediately. I put down an IPS, I put it in front of your firewall and it's gonna show you stuff immediately. Part of the joy of the honeypot is saying, listen, you shouldn't get a lot of alerts, it's only when it really matters. So you plug it in and then wait. Okay, and somehow that's just not uh, an impressive sales technique. Okay, um, the other thing is that the honeypot isn't preventative and people for a really long time were still hooked up on preventing all the things. Okay, nowadays more people are starting to come around to you're just not going to, you need to detect and contain. Um, the other thing is you're selling to defenders and by their nature defenders have thousands of fires that they're trying to put out at any given time. Um, the honeypot uh, kind of uh, easily gets ignored through all this. Um, the third one is the one that I find particularly interesting. One of our theories is that honeypots were sold badly. Um, and, and I don't mean sold in the money sense, I mean they were pitched badly. Um, if you look at academic papers today, you'll find that honeypots are heavily overrepresented. Anyone doing their masters, even guys at the honors level, want to know what to do? Either you put up some Wi-Fi stuff or you put up a honeypot and track results. Um, and it's kind of interesting that if you watch the early HoneyNet papers, all of them kind of unknowingly aimed at this academic bent. It was, let's try to understand this. Let's do research into the tactics. And the whole technology seems to have pigeonholed itself into people who are doing research, uh, trying to study other people. Um, something we forget from the Cliff Stoll example 
is that he had a really specific need. Someone was coming into his network. He wanted to know what this guy was doing then. And so for him, studying the attacker made sense. I'm guessing for most of you, studying the attacker is not what you need to worry about. What you need to worry about is, when has really bad stuff happened on my network? Um, and so all of this kind of pushed it into one direction, and it kind of became the redhead stepchild of InfoSec. And um, in 2002, um, do you guys remember this talk? Okay, um, some of you will. Um, this was Gobbles at DEF CON giving a talk called The Wolves Amongst Us. Um, and it's kind of interesting because he dedicated, or they dedicated a whole bunch of their time specifically to picking on the HoneyNet project. They actually called people from the HoneyNet project up on stage um, to publicly embarrass them. Um, and part of what they did was say, well, look, uh, well, actually, I suspect we can... Projects, the ones that we're learning in the kitchen are the kids. They're, they're really stupid, fucked up, can't, you know, can't figure out how to even install rootkit type kids. The black hats that know what the fuck they're doing, like, they're not going to be next vision. Wait, here we go. Um, on Project Honey, that's been around for three years now, I think. Um, have they discovered a single unknown vulnerability being exploited in the wild? What? I think like half of one. <laughs> Where's the other? And um, you have to. Um, so what's really interesting about that video is even RFP, who was up on stage there um, on the right, um, goes to defend the HoneyNet project by saying, "Look, we're not trying to catch serious black hats. We're just trying to catch the kids who don't know what they're doing. Um, this is just an exercise in in studying what the underground does." And Gobbles then goes on to say, "Well, hold on. Like we don't care." If there's kids doing kid stuff, stop talking like what you do actually matters. Okay, um, so our thesis really quickly is that we desperately need them to come back. And probably the biggest reason for this is because we can't keep going on with people only finding out they breached when Brian Krebs calls them. Okay, um, the Verizon DBIR report uh, gives a ridiculous statistic um, back in 2012. 92% of the companies that were exploited or compromised only found out about it when a third party told them that they were compromised. Um, and if you think about it, this is kind of predictable. If you consider uh, the game that you're playing as a defender, as a game of chess, um, currently the big problem that you have is that you only see half of the board. Um, you don't have any visibility into what the attacker is doing. Um, and when we talk about bringing in the honeypots, we're not saying that you're suddenly going to get 100% visibility into what they are doing. We're just saying, let's make that board look a little bit different for them too. Okay, let's introduce something on the board that makes them uh, have to work a little bit harder. Um, invariably, what the introduction of honeypots does is messes with the traditional asymmetry problem that people talk about. So forever, defenders have been saying, the problem is, they have to defend all the time, and attackers only have to win once. Okay, with honeypots, what you're trying to do is trying to capitalize on the fact that once someone's broken into your network, that asymmetry now turns around. He's got to stay away all the time. He's got to keep clear all the time. You just have to catch him once, and you then are in a position to burn his uh, TTPs. Um, so given all of this, why is it still rare? Um, one of the things, or, or the reasons we come up with, is mainly a list of arguments. There's a list of sometimes reasonable arguments on why people uh, will or won't go the honey net route. Um, we're gonna blitz through some of them, um, and in answering them, we'll show you some of the tech that we've built. Um, the first one, and almost everyone says this the moment you talk about building defensive tech, is isn't this just gonna be an arms race? You're gonna start an arms race. You're gonna do a honeypot and attackers are gonna try to figure you out. Um, so martial um, military terms are overused. I just wanna make it clear, this was the definitive arms race. Okay, this is the number of warheads uh, between the US and USSR. Um, and at that point, uh, at their peak, we were looking at about 40,000 warheads. This is the USA versus Korea. Okay, who currently have uh, an estimated maybe 30 warheads. This is not an arms race. Okay, what you're looking at here is two people having technology. When you consider networks getting attacked today, it's not an arms race between defenders and attackers. 
When OPM manages to be hacked for a full year before anyone knows about it, when technology companies like RSA manage to lose their crown jewels, it's not an arms race. That's already lost. What you actually want is to at least make it an arms race where you at least at the table, making them work a little harder for their money. Um, the second argument that constantly comes up is, if I drop your honey pots in, is it gonna now introduce new risk to my organization? Okay, and there's a bunch of things you can do about this for all of the technology that we'll show you today. Um, we've built it in Python, so it's uh, memory safe. Um, we support only minimal protocols. And one of the simple technical things that we say is, it doesn't matter if your honeypot gets compromised, as long as it manages to shoot off one alert, okay? Because if it gets off that one alert, you're in a better position than you were yesterday. But besides for the technical answers, I'd actually like to answer this on a slightly more um, meta level, um, which is when someone tells me, um, won't your honeypot introduce risk into my organization, I almost wanna scream, come on. Like, like let's be serious. We all know that your organization actually has an old NT4 box that nobody's got around to patching. You've got a bunch of boxes still vulnerable to MSO8 all over the network. But when you're having this conversation on should I use honeypots, suddenly you're the most pristine network that can't handle a single box that will maybe get compromised, kind of. Okay? And, and this actually points to a bigger problem. Um, it's a problem that hurts us in security. Fairly recently, I was trying to convince an organization that they should be deploying Emmet, um, or Microsoft's uh, Emmet all over. And one of the guys on their team is a really skilled reverser. And he came in and he told me, I can bypass Emmet. I'm like, sure you can, but you guys have boxes that are so old, you're getting compromised daily, okay? And we need to break out of this uh, almost strange utopia versus reality split that happens when it comes to evaluating technology. Um, and we need to get uh, a little more realistic about it. Um, so the next argument that comes up is uh, the stuff is painful to deploy. It's gonna be a lot more work. I'm already struggling to manage all of the boxes on my network. You're now talking about giving me new boxes. And largely, this is the problem that we set out uh, technically to solve. Um, Thinkst Canary is a product that we sell, so we won't talk a lot about it. Um, it deploys in three minutes. Um, if we're talking about Open Canary today, it's actually got even more of the technology uh, that we use in Canary, largely because we're using it as the bleeding edge. It'll deploy and be useful in minutes. Um, lots of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about should be absolutely uh, super quick to pick up. So I'm going to introduce now um, this Open Canary uh, tool, which is one of the tools, one of a, a few that we're uh, releasing today. In truth, the, the term Open Canary encompasses a number of these projects, but it also refers to the main tool uh, in the suite. Um, and to kind of define it, um, so we've defined it as a, a mixed interaction a honeypot. And it, it's a bit of a, a weasel word to say it's mixed interaction, but the reason for that is there's both high and low interaction uh, components, but there's also part of it which doesn't fit neatly into either of those models. So if we have to name it, it'll be mixed, but um, hopefully I'm going to show you parts of this which you wouldn't typically find in either a high or a low interaction uh, honeypot. As Harun's mentioned, it's uh, something we've written in Python, so it reduces that risk component. Um, and the thing that we're particularly focused on, um, and, and Harun's touched on it, is this idea of having one alert. Um, that comes out of the system. So to have high quality signals, there's no point in having um, a setup that is you know, giving you, like you come in in the morning and you go through your uh, canary alerts and then you, you, know, you ignore the ones which are false alarms. Like that's not what we're aiming for. We're aiming for those high quality alerts. Um, so we want this thing to be extremely easy to deploy and we'll touch on this again, but when you get into those arms races, if you can reduce that cycle between um, the attack of figuring out what a honeypot looks like um, and introducing fingerprints for it, if the defender has a cycle which uh, manages to patch that quicker, then the defender wins. So easy update, easy deploy becomes a big part of um, this project. Um, and so we see these things as sensors. In other words, uh, you have a bunch of these things. They're, they're really easy to deploy. Deploy them through your network. They provide a feed of events which get uh, coalesced into um, incidents. And you can install this standalone, so you can have a, a hunt, uh, an open canary install which pings you on every event. Um, but the ideal one uh, includes the tool that we call the correlator. 
um, and that will let you uh, get very high quality signals. So I'm going to show you uh, a demonstration of the installation and configuring of a basic uh, MySQL uh, Honey Canary, sorry, Open Canary uh, instance. Okay, so we've got two terminals here. Um, there's attacker in red and the defender or the sysadmin is here on the blue terminal. Um, and so the, the attacker somehow comes across a machine on the network which happens to be called Canary, um, runs a scan, there's no ports open. The defender wants to install at some point a honeypot um, and so decides to go with uh, open Canary. And so because we're using Python, uh, what I want to highlight here is that we use sort of the standard Pythonic ways of doing things. It's packaged as a Python a PyPI package. So that means it's pip installable. Um, pip gives you, if you're not familiar with it, essentially it handles um, package dependencies and all of that. Um, there's a, a sort of a distributed uh, mirroring system um, for these packages. So you can simply cron job uh, an update. And so you can keep uh, up to date with your Open Canary um, really quickly. Okay, so that's the install of uh, Open Canary. The configuration occurs via a uh, JSON file. So all of our So we can simply enable the MySQL module which is already enabled in this one. But you, what you'll see from if you quickly scan that you can alter banners and ports and what you would kind of expect to find um, on most honeypot uh, software. Um, so we start our honeypot. Um, so the, the little bit of hand waving that I'm going to do at this point is there's a correlator already running in the background. Its configuration is also quite easy. So essentially that just gets an email address to alert to or uh, a mobile number. Um, and so we've got our setup to alert to a mobile and to email. And um, so what you'll hear during the presentation hopefully are the alerts coming through on the mobile as well. So we've got the open canary running now on um, this defender's host. The attacker scans the host again at some point. We now see there's an open um, MySQL. If the attacker decides to do a, a version scan, then again you would get the banner that comes out. So this now starts to look like um, a MySQL instance. So at this point the attacker decides they want to log in. So this could be a physical or a manual login. This could also be um, a brute force of some kind. tries to log in and at this point the canary has picked up the login attempt um, and what we should have is uh, an alert that comes through. Okay, so uh, can we get the podium mic volume up? So the alert came through on the, uh, on the phone. So podium mic? <laughs> Hello? No. All right. Thank you. All right, so we'll get the other ones that come through but we'll also see um, the mail that's come through this side. So there's a MySQL login attempt that's uh, happened. All right. So very quickly we can reduce that, that cycle for deploying a canary um, and uh, getting sort of uh, real um, incidents that we care about. They come through quite quickly. So that's uh, the MySQL uh, demo. Um, one of the reasons that we've written it in Python and, and it's based on the twisted framework, so if you're familiar with Python that'll mean something to you, um, is that it makes it really easy to write modules, it makes it really easy to extend. So by way of example, um, the SIP module that we've got, again it focuses on um, things that you care about and if someone is scanning your uh, network inside and is trying to issue SIP requests to random hosts, that's something you want to be aware of. So the SIP module doesn't have to employ um, or doesn't have to try and understand the full SIP protocol. You want to know if someone is trying to do SIP stuff inside your network, this thing will tell you and the module's 18 lines of Python. Um, and so it becomes really easy to extend and really easy to add new modules. The kinds of modules that we have, they're, they're listed there um, and most of those uh, will be familiar to you. I guess the one which um, we want to just mention briefly is um, having Git. So if you're a, a dev shop, um, you might have a, a Git server inside uh, and your, your source repos are something that you want to uh, protect. You want to also be aware of um, 
someone who is trying to find Git servers inside your organization. That's certainly activity which uh, you would want to be aware of. So each of those modules has different kinds of triggers that uh, we consider to be high quality alerts. Failed logins are, are a strong one. Um, uh, there's other examples. So within, a, within NTP, um, if someone is issuing monolist commands to your NTP servers, that's often a, a technique for recon uh, inside organizations. Um, we've spoken about SIP. Um, and then the final one there is uh, one we'll do a, a demo on, but it's essentially um, a, a Samba and file reads. So if someone is scanning your uh, internal shares, um, you can deploy through Open Canary a file share that has files on it, and if someone tries to read those files, uh, then you get notified. Because it's Samba, it means that you can tie it into Active Directory, so this thing can even exist um, in a domain. So if someone's browsing your network via a Windows Explorer and, and through um, uh, the, network, uh, the network browser, then they'll come up, or your Canary can uh, appear there. So I'm going to demo then. Um, showing you what all th or running all the modules looks like, and then I'm going to show you three specific modules um, from this. Okay, so my run script just wraps up starting Samba and a few other things. Um, and it also has uh, a separate config file. Um, at this point, the uh, Open Canary service is running. If the attacker now scans um, that same Canary, there's a, a different configuration. There's now a bunch more modules that are um, accessible to them. And so the first one that we'll look at is um, this file share. So. You have uh, someone on a Windows machine, they're browsing the network, they come across um, the share on the network, it has a few files, they open up one of the files, um, they get to see the contents of the file, um, but at the same time we should get an alert that comes through. All right, so there's your alert that comes through as soon as that file gets opened. Um, in the same way, what we can do is uh, we, we've integrated a project, there's a separate project called RDPy. Um, which gives you uh, an RDP uh, or Windows Remote Desktop um, honeypot. And there's a lot of cool stuff that uh, is possible in this one. So this for us is um, still a proof of concept and it's sort of on the, on the leading edge of where we're going. But um, you can connect to the canary. It gives, you, uh, it gives you an RDP interface. What it's actually showing you at this point, and this is from straight from that project, the RDP project. So that's the attempted login. Um, that happens with a credential sent with the initial connection to the RDP server. Um, what it's actually showing you here is a video, so a screen cap of a previous, uh, a previous RDP instance. So we're not connecting to a Windows server, we're connecting to Twisted and it's essentially looping a video of what uh, an RDP session might look like. And so we can capture keystrokes at this point and determine if they're trying to um, brute force passwords and so on. And then the final demo I'm just going to talk about, um, but that's we can also, uh, there's a VNC module, and um, so we can capture you know, connections. Again, failed logins against a VNC instance. Okay, so we integrate those projects, RDPy, Kippo, uh, and Samba, um, and we give shots to all of those guys. So this project is open source, Open Canary is open source, it's available uh, at, at opencanary.org. Uh, and that code is there. Um, with the, the correlator code still needs to go up, but it'll go up um, in the next day or so. So that's hopefully put to bed the idea that they're hard to deploy. The next argument is that they get noisy. So you've just got another device that's spitting logs um, and no one's going to look at those. And, and one of those, if you, if you remember, we refer to our canaries as uh, sensors and sensors can get noisy. So the correlator is then that component which uh, accepts feeds from multiple canaries and coalesces them. So for example, if someone uh, conducts a brute force attack against your MySQL instance, the canary is going to issue an event for every um, authentication try, uh, but actually that's all part of the same brute force attack. And so we don't build that log logic into the open canary, we keep it as simple as possible, but that logic is then built into the correlator. And that allows you to do things like detect if someone's scanning for a given, a single port, but across your entire network. Deploy multiple canaries through the network 
I mean, you can, with the feed that's coming back from them, you can easily figure out if someone is scanning across your network. Um, the next argument is then, well, is the attacker ever actually going to bump into it? And we can phrase this a bit differently to say, well, how can you lead an attacker to your um, honeypot? And so it, it starts to get into a thing of uh, discoverability. How can you make, or how can you lead, or how, how can you help attackers find your honeypots? Um, the attackers in your network have a lot of targets they can aim at. Um, but you want them to actually focus on your, um, on your honeypots. And so there's sort of two factors that we think contribute towards discoverability. The one is references and the other one is density, honeypot density. Um, and why you want to focus on this is because if an attacker is only conducting passive recon and your, uh, your canary is staying quiet, then there's a, a good chance they just never uh, find it. So when we say that there's two factors, density and references, what we mean by references are a reference is any artifact that leads an attacker to your, uh, to your honeypot. So it could be a config file entry, it could be a packet on the network, um, it could be an entry in one of the directory services, um, but all of those are references that point to your honeypot. And you can distribute references throughout your um, organization. The other option is you can also increase the density of your honeypots. You can have more honeypots. And if they're easy to deploy and if there's uh, if it's you know, trivial like, uh, as we've made Open Canary, then you can really spread them out. And so now an attacker randomly probing the network um, is likely to come across uh, one of your honeypots. So it leads us to this completely made up graph, but like what, we're, like what we're trying to, the point that we're trying to get to is that there is some kind of trade off, but these are not, they're not, um, oh, they're orthogonal to each other, exactly as the graph says. So, uh, we've got references and density, and there's some kind of optimal honeypot deployment that you can aim for, some kind of efficient deployment. And, and we have a, a suspicion it looks something like that. You can have lots of references with a few number of honeypots or lots of honeypots without a lot of references to them. Um, and of course you can have lots of references and honeypots, but then that's just uh, probably inefficient. It's probably more expensive than you need to be. So within Open Canary specifically, we get to this issue of uh, discoverability. and uh, out of the box, Open Canary supports um, a few discoverability options um, listed there, but it's essentially um, what you'd normally find, the kind of traffic you'd find on a network. And we think that it's possible to do more. So for um, this particular topic, we think that your canaries should be producing more than the services necessarily that they've got running on them. Uh, and we've got a sort of a research tool that I guess we'll also push out after this, a thing called a Hardida. I don't know if that's an international term, but it's... In, uh, uh, sacred ibis is that bird in South Africa. We call those things hardy dars because of the noise they make. And they accept just essentially very loud things. And um, so this tool is uh, an attempt at making a tool that attracts attention to a given host. And so it does how you would imagine it to do, uh, or it does what it does in the way that you probably imagine it, that it does it, um, by essentially emulating a bunch of network protocols. Um, there is one other way that we think that it can uh, can work. So if you sniff a random Ethernet network on, on a large organization, if there's mild congestion even, um, you will see packets from hosts that are not your own. So you'll see um, TCP packets and those packets will, they'll be in the middle of someone else's stream and the switch for whatever reason decided you needed it at this stage. And your host ignores it because it's not addressed to you. If someone's sniffing the network, they've seen those packets. So um, what Hardidar will do is generate those fake packets uh, and essentially it can insert um, interesting bits of data. So for example, uh, on a fake telnet or a fake packet on the telnet port, it can insert something that looks like a password. And then on your open canary, if you see that password being used, well then that's a very curious thing. Someone's sniffing the network and trying to pull out, um, pull out content. There's some drawbacks to this. Um, essentially, that, that tool can be fingerprinted. Um, but at that point, talking about that asymmetry problem, um, if you know that a fingerprint for Hardy Die has been built into attack tools, you can make your servers look like Hardy Die. And at that point, now the attacker is again in this position where they don't know is this um, something that I care about or is this uh, something that has been put in place to trip me up. So that takes us on to this po the idea of fingerprinting, um, at which point H takes over. <laughs> um, uh, so, one of the other arguments that always come up here is. Um, and it kind of ties into my earlier rant, which is the I can fingerprint your honeypot, therefore your honeypot sucks. Um, like I can use this technique to figure it out. Um, Todd Beardsley did a really nice talk from Metasploit on discovering Kippo, for example. 
Um, so now built into Metasploit is a way that you can discover it. And, and again, there's two ways you can hit this. One is, for change, we can start fighting that fight both ways. Because you can automatically update or because you can pull updates for Open Canary, you can now have a situation where you actually can respond to those things. You can uh, match them technically. But also, um, the argument itself is kind of flawed. Okay, the stuff comes up uh, pretty consistently. There's a talk happening um, at Black Hat this year um, on fingerprinting and discovering a whole bunch of honeypots. Um, and I'll tell you why I think it's slightly misguided. Um, way back when uh, Sebek was one of the popular honeypots, so this was in 2003, and what Sebek used to do was allow you to surreptitiously take your keystrokes from your honeypotted machine and send it to another host for monitoring. Um, that was 2K3. In 2K4, um, at Cansec West, um, a bunch of really smart guys gave a talk on breaking honeypots. Okay, and what the talk was, um, they had a whole bunch of ways that you could detect when Sebek was running on a machine. Um, and again, it's good research, and it's research uh, that needs to happen. And the way the guys were doing it was exactly like you'd predict, right? You look for differences, look for subtle changes, um, Sebek was running as a kernel module, so look for ways that you can detect that there's a kernel module that's tried to hide itself. Um, at the time, they were using uh, Joanna Rutkowska's Red Pill, okay, so a way to discover that the host uh, was actually virtualized. Um, and in truth, it's kind of not the point, okay? The guys who hit OPM um, were not running Red Pill to first see if they were on a Trojan machine. Um, the guys who hit Target um, they went in, and after the discovery, you find out they kind of ran like bulls in a china shop. Okay, and so again, we need to draw this line between, yes, I can defeat you in the lab, and yes, you'll probably add value because you're going to pick this up on a real network. Um, both those things are not the same, and, and we keep confusing them um, almost as if they are. Um, so one of the other arguments that always come up is, look, a honeypot is a nice to have. We think we'll get to it someday, but first we've got to do all these other things. Um, Tom Cross recently uh, went on a little uh, Twitter uh, tweet storm about it, um, essentially where he said, look, there's lots of other stuff you should do first. Most people don't get deception. Uh, worry about it later. Okay, and you can go and read uh, the, the gist of it, but essentially he was saying, sort out everything else, then worry about your honeypot stuff. Um, and I had a discussion with him, um, and essentially one of the things that you need to consider here is when you say it's a waste of time, that only matters if the time you're talking about is a lot of time. If we saying you can get Canary up and running in three minutes from the unboxing, or open Canary up in five minutes, then I'm gonna say you can't really say it's a waste of time. Don't get coffee this afternoon, and you're done. Okay, as long as your canaries don't add extra overhead uh, to your day-to-day -day activities, if you can drop them and forget about them until they're actually warning you about real attacks, um, it's, it's actually a non-argument. Um, so if we're saying canaries installed in three minutes, uh, open canary installs in three minutes, we're actually asking now if there's anything we can do that's quicker than this. Um, and what we're going to touch on here are canary tokens. Um, again, not a new idea. Um, back in 2003, Lance Spitzner was talking about honey tokens. Um, uh, Eugene Spafford um, and uh, Kim were talking about it in 94. Um, and actually, it's a pretty ancient concept. So I'm not sure if you guys know, but way back when uh, people made money selling maps, what they do is put in fake cities on their maps. And if your fake city showed up on someone else's map, um, you'd then know that uh, he copied your map. Um, the, the city of Aglo there is kind of interesting because guys actually took a map, went to where they thought they were on the city, then named their shop, Shop of Aglo, and a whole city actually built around the shop so a fake city actually sprung up, a real city sprung up where a fake city was. Um, but uh, essentially it brings us uh, to what we're going to talk about here in the form of Canary tokens. Um, and so again, the idea here is uh, pretty simple. We're going to have um, a sort of a unique tag or a unique piece of data and we're going to embed that throughout our already existing network. So open Canary is to say here is what we can do when we have a fake 
set of services. Canary tokens are the way that you can um, start to deploy detection into uh, an already uh, live system. Um, so we've got a number of channels that these things can be triggered over um, and sort of we'll, we'll talk about them in, in a little bit more detail as we get them. Um, the alerts that come through, we, again, they're going to come through on uh, the mobile. So if you hear um, that uh, message receive signal, that's the alert coming through. I'm not going to be switching to, I'm not going to be showing you the full alerts. We're a little bit short. So uh, really basically, or really simply, the so Canary Tokens is uh, currently live. So that site is there, canarytokens.org. Um, we can um, we can create a token. It's going to come back with a generated token in a bunch of different formats. One of them is sort of a standard um, web bug. Um, so the standard web bug is something that you would be ex you would have experienced with spam and, and those sort of things. It's a unique URL. If someone hits the URL. Um, we will get uh, we'll get that alert, All right? All right. So there's the alert. It says that someone hit your web bug. All right. So that's what an alert looks like. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to be coming back to the alert um, for the next little bit. Um, but the web is just one way that we can detect these, uh, these tokens. So we can embed it in a URL which might get distributed. But we could also, for example, embed it in a DNS channel, right? So we could embed it in a DNS host name. If that host name ever gets queried, then that fires uh, the alert. And, and I'm going to skip this demo. I think the, the concept is pretty straightforward. We have a token. It's in a host name. If that host name ever gets queried, the query comes back to our DNS server at canarytokens.org and we know that um, someone has been looking up this host name. And why that's important is we use it as a building block and it gets used as a building block on some of the additional channels. So these are the channels that we support uh, that are currently available. On the output side there's email and SMS. And on the input side we've got HTTP DNS which I've spoken about, SMTP for generating fake mailboxes. And then there's also Imager, LinkedIn and Bitcoin. Just to sort of throw a few mixtures in the pot and what we're trying to show there is the kind of thinking that we can have when it comes to um, honey tokens. So Imager in particular is an interesting one. Um, if you look at that honey pot, uh, if you look at the honey token um, web bug that I showed you, um, the argument against it is that, well, I, I just need to um, set your canarytokens.org domain in my host file to 127.001 and then I'll never trigger any of your honey tokens. So what we introduce here is a level of indirection. We say, well, what we'll do is we'll monitor an imager file or an imager link. Image is an image hosting uh, site. And so we can uh, monitor an image on that site and if the view count ever changes, then we know someone has tried to hit that link. And so the canary token in this instance is actually an imager file. If you're going to block imager, like how are you going to look at your cats? Um, so like you need imager and you're not gonna you're not gonna block that one. So we can we can start to use indirection for canary tokens, um, and that way, um, if someone says we'll block your domains, like yeah, go ahead, um, block the internet. So this we're also releasing. This is another tool getting released today. Um, we've got a live site at canarytokens.org, so you can generate. You don't need to install it if you don't want to. But what we strongly recommend is pull down this, the the code, um, or in fact, to make the deployment even easier, we've released Docker images. So register a few domains and you can be up and running with your own canary tokens. We can take these tokens now and start to find funny ways in which they can be applied. And so um, part of it is, well, how can we use them to spot attackers on a network? If that's the building block, what are the actual nuts and bolts where we're going to use um, these canary tokens? And we've got a list of places that we think they can be used and we'll start to, to walk through them. So the first one is we want to try and examine, uh, we want to be notified if anyone tries to read a particular file, a sensitive file. So for example, if you happen to be um, a, if you happen to be the manufacturer of um, let's say a security software and you've got a number of source repos and they all look, uh, so we've got a bunch of source repos here um, and you want to know if anyone ever tries to read any of your, um, any of your source repos. You can do this via git hooks or some other version control system hooks. Um, but if someone gains direct access to the server, then um, you're not going to get notified via that hook. 
So what we do is we generate a token. This is a DNS token. The defender, the defender runs this little tool called Canaryfy. Um, he can specify a process name to hide it if he wants. Um, we paste in our token and we point it at the file that we want to be notified if anyone ever tries to read that file. Okay, so we're watching this particular README file. At some point, that server gets compromised. Here's our attacker in red. Attacker goes into that particular directory. They're exploring all the repos. Um, and they cut that README file. They don't get any notification. Obviously, they still see the file. Uh, but what we'll find is that triggers the canary token. And um, here is our canary file token that gets sent. So you'll also see that loop is extremely fast, right? File read happens, we get in the alert within, um, with, with, uh, within the time that we can't even um, switch to. Okay, so we can do the same thing in OSX via a different mechanism. We can do it via a dtrace script, but again, the idea is file read happens, we trigger the token. We can do that for um, process running again in OSX as well. So process gets run, uh, that might be a, a particular whitelisted process, uh, sorry, a blacklisted process. We get notified when that process runs. Um, we can do the same thing in uh, Windows, but for directory browsing. So if we want to find out if someone is snooping around the network, we showed you a way to do it in Open Canary, where you deploy a fake uh, file server. This is interesting because in this method, you can take your legitimate file server, deploy a file to the server, and if anyone tries to read it, you get notified. And the way that we do that is we reuse desktop.ini. So if anyone ever qualified on like Windows 3.1, um, you might be familiar with desktop.ini, but essentially um, the sum of it is if someone goes into that, into a, a folder that has a desktop.ini, it's going to try and load an icon from a path that we specify. That path is a UNC path, which is a network path. UNC paths can contain uh, domain names, and so we can get a ping back if someone simply browses into a directory. Okay, so that's what the desktop.ini looks like. Um, so I'm going to skip the uh, that particular demo, but the idea there is that you hit, you, you browse into a folder and you get a canary alert. So it means no uh, integration for, no additional login, no additional audit, no additional um, agents or anything, but you can still be notified when people are poking around. That same technique works for zip files, so zip, uh, WinZip and WinRA will happily unzip um, desktop.ini, so you can in this way figure out if someone is unzipping particular files. In terms of databases, we can deploy uh, canary tokens into databases as well. Go quick. Hmm? Yeah, so uh, for making the theoretical uh, possible, essentially here what we're saying is we've got a way that we can detect if someone is querying a table in a SQL Server database. That advice is something that you will hear in lots of, uh, from lots of people, like just deploy a honey token into a database and figure out if someone queries it, try and do it. It's a little tougher than um, you, you think it is. Um, and so we've got a method where we can essentially trigger a stored procedure when someone looks at a view. The view might be something like uh, user passwords. So if anyone, an attacker is browsing your, your database, they try and select from that view, uh, you get a uh, ping back in your canary token. MySQL is a, a different, or has an additional complexity. We want, the problem here is we're trying to track failed logins. Um, and MySQL only writes that information out to a text file. It doesn't give you any trigger inside the database. So it produces or it gives us an alternative way to, um, uh, to start to trigger Canary tokens. And that's, we've got another piece of software re we're releasing today called Canary Token D. And it's a generic log file tailor. So it'll tailor log file and pull out lines that you care about via regex and then trigger um, a Canary token from that. So the setup, it'll step you through the setup. The attacker tries to uh, log into the host and you get your um, token. Again, we can start to use these tokens in files as well. So you'll be familiar with the idea of um, word files um, that ping back. So I'm not going to spend too much more time on that, but Canary token supports those. We also do it for PDF. And, and why I like this particular example is that uh, Adobe Reader, there's a, essentially a, a cheap trick that we can employ with Adobe Reader. But the sum of it is um, we can get notified if someone opens a file, a PDF file in Adobe Reader, regardless of whether or not they allow or disallow um, network, the network communication. So it's an, and that's how, in how Adobe Reader handles DNS responses. So the, the, the user would see a pop-up, but by that time you've already been notified about the 
Canary. Um, so we're about to get kicked off the stage. Um, I'll be really quick. Once you've got um, the building blocks, uh, like we said, you can start to do more and more creative, tiny things with them. Um, one of our clients, for example, kept having their web pages copied for phishing attacks. We can now insert JavaScript onto that page that says, check when you are loaded, check whether you're running on client domain. If not, fetch this Canary token. So now anytime their page is copied, the first person who surfs to it actually notifies you that he's no longer, your site is no longer running on your domain. Um, there's a whole bunch of things like this. Um, it allows you to get a little bit sillier. Like Marco says, if we're tracking LinkedIn, you can create a fake network admin, use the Canary token, and then get told when someone's looking at your uh, fake admin's profile. Um, the only way they'd get to him is searching for network admins at your org. Um, and the last one that we thought was kind of cute and is worth quickly mentioning here um, is using advertising networks as a sort of canary. Um, so what you'll see we did here is created a quick hash. Um, we then go to Bing adverts, and I'll tell you why we use Bing, um, and we bought that adword. Okay, so we said if this hash ever shows up in a search, we want to run our ad on it. Um, we, Bing actually allows us to go a little further and tie a I'm willing to bid any money for this, just bid the money and mail me. Um, so they become our canary for us. Um, and then you'll see when someone searches for the hash, um, you'll actually notice that's our ad showing up there that says, okay, you have problems or you have extremely bad luck. Um, and essentially we then get a view count increase in our, in our ad service and Bing is nice enough to mail us to say, listen, we ran your rule. Um, but essentially it means that your canary was now picked up, someone searched for it, um, and the only reason they searched for it was because bad stuff has happened. Um, so to wrap it up, uh, the last two arguments almost meld together. People say, look, this honeypot stuff is cute and it's fun for research, but it's not enterprise grade. Um, again, really simply, um, our canary stuff we sell. So it's out there, we've got it running in uh, on networks all around the world. Um, we've got happy customers with it, so clearly it's not just uh, for fun. Um, and the last argument that comes up is not another one, okay? Because if you look, there's actually a ton of guys who've built honeypot tools uh, at some point or the other. Um, and if you actually look at this, you'll find that lots of them have died. Um, HoneyD was excellent and the last time the code was touched was 2007. Um, there's projects that haven't been touched since 2003. Um, and essentially what we're saying here, um, as strange as it sounds, is we're making money off our Canary stuff. Um, so we are heavily incentivized to keep on development. So Open Canary is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, we need it. It's important to us. Um, we're giving it to you guys free. You should use it. Um, so parting thoughts, Canaries, honeypots are a good idea that have largely been ignored for the last bit. Um, detecting infiltrations months or years after the compromise is increasingly inexcusable. I think boards will forgive you for saying we got owned, people get owned, but being able to say we got owned two years ago and only found out about it now is getting hard to defend. Um, canary, open canary, canary tokens, literally your investment time-wise is minutes, um, which means you really shouldn't have an excuse uh, for getting caught with your pants down two years later. Um, other than that, all of the stuff, all of the URLs are up there for, for you guys to use the stuff. Marco and I will still be around. I'm not sure if we have any time for questions. Um, Same. No? Same. Wrap it up. Um, right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, yeah, you guys can drop us a mail or ping us on uh, the Twitters or grab us now. Thanks a lot.